Good morning, everyone. Good morning, people of God. Good morning, people of God. You know, it always gives me so much excitement to be able to greet you all uh, because, you know, the Lord of heaven, of earth, and the universe, he calls us his people. He calls you his person. You know, he even goes a bit further and he esteems us a lot more. So if we could all, as modern Christians, turn on our Bibles. There you go. And if we could turn to First uh, Peter uh, chapter 2, verses 9. And actually, we're going to read this together as an affirmation over one another. So, are you there? Not yet. Modern Christians. There we go. All right. So, in First Peter 2, 9, this is what the Lord says over us. He calls us. He says... But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a powerful affirmation, you know. In this uh, day and age, we live in a world that's constantly trying to strip us of identity. It's trying to fill us with sort of confusion and doubt about who we truly are. But God gives us an identity, hallelujah. He gives us an identity. And my challenge to you is whenever you see one another, give each other that, that holy greeting uh, to esteem one another. You know, uh, actually, we could do that right now. If you could turn to the person right next to you and just say, good morning, man or woman of God. <laughs> Wonderful. Hallelujah, hallelujah. It is good to see so much warmth in the room. I, I, I love, love this sort of thing, and, and so does God. You know, you, you should never underestimate the power of a good greeting. You know, someone in this room, this, what you have said may have been the kindest thing you've, that they've heard all week. So it's very, very important that we do not underestimate the power of a good and holy greeting. Hallelujah. Uh, so now that I've caused a little bit of a stir, uh, I'm going to, you know, sort of open up by saying that I'm extremely humbled to be here. Um, for those who don't know, my name is Alistair. Uh, I'm a member of All Nations Christian Center and extremely blessed to sit on the leadership team here with George, with uh, uh, Pastor Ellie in training, uh, with Pastor Billy and with Pastor Keith. Um, and, you know, as we know, many a great person has stood on this very pulpit to share the word of God with you. Uh, so it's a, it's a huge privilege to be able to be here and, and share. So I am going to pray so I don't mess this up. <laughs> So, um, you know, we're all going to pray together. So if you could just sort of raise your hands, we're just going to pray and channel the word of the Lord to come through to us all in the name of Jesus. Father, Lord God, may your word today find the souls that it is looking for. May it minister to us all. And may you keep me out of the message and shine forth to your people that they may glorify you and live by your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So what is the word for today, you all ask. Well, the word for today is, hey, there we go. Christ saved me so. Christ saved me so. That is the, that is the word for today. Uh, so, you know, I, I, was given, I was given that particular, particular title and, the, and there's context to this. So, you know, in the lead up to Pont Pentecost, where we as a church were, we were getting to know the person of the Holy Spirit. And um, during that time, you know, I received a very strong ministration from the Lord where he was actually trying, he was reminding me that it was important to know uh, the person that made the ministration of the Holy Spirit possible, Jesus Christ. So today's message is all about him. And, um, you know, uh, as, as we know, he is the author, he is the finisher of our faith. And, you know, I've spent time, you know, with him over the last few weeks, just meditating over his sacrifice and the power that has been made available to us. So if you're new to Christianity uh, or are curious about why we gather here with so much fervence and so much devotion, uh, this message is definitely for you. Uh, and if you've known God all your life uh, and you've been close to him, then this message is for you too. Because uh, as we serve, it's important to have these necessary reminders of why we even began serving in the first place. You know, when I actually uh, wrote that line, I was thinking about, you know, what, it, what it's like to be married. You know, married folks in the room, show of hands. 
You know, I've been um, married for, for four years now to a, a beautiful lady at the, who's sitting at the back of the room now who doesn't want to be, doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> Uh, you know, and I, but I've been by her side for about 10 years. And, you know, it's safe to say that after knowing someone for that long, uh, you know, as time goes on, the fire you had sometimes can flicker and sometimes may even dim. And much is the same, you know, with our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It, ca- it can be like that as well. But do you know, every time I call to mind, you know, how, you know, Hanum and I started our journey, you know, um, why we said yes to one another and how good she is with my heart, you know, the fire comes back with a lot of force and there's a reignition, you know, there's a rekindling. So I'm, I'm hoping that we all are rekindled by the word of God and we spend time with him so we can be rekindled and reignited in, in our journeys. And, you know... Jesus has done so much for us. So how can, we, how can we sit in complacency when he is even up there in the heavens right now uh, mediating on our behalf as our high priest before God? All the time, all the time. So shall we go to the beginning of our love story with Jesus? So at the beginning, God obviously created us all and he blessed us with two double-edged swords. And those two double-edged swords were free will and dominion over the earth. You see, we served, we worshipped, and we walked with God with our free will, and we tended the earth. And he placed it into our hands, and he made us his specially created steward. Could you turn to your neighbor and say, you were specially created? (laughs) Hallelujah, hallelujah. You were. We all were. We were all specially created for this very, very, very purpose. You see, back then, we walked in innocence until temptation, until temptation came to the door and told us that we lacked. Can you imagine? Even though we'd literally been given everything that we absolutely needed. And we fell, and we fell very, very hard. You know, we fell for the lie that there was more, that we could have more, and that we could be more when we were already perfect. Strange. And in that instant, you know, when we fell and we ate of that fruit, sin was woven into the DNA of every human being that would succeed Adam and Eve, you know, from the tree of the knowledge of good good and evil. And we were only three chapters into the Bible here, you know, just three chapters in, you know, and we'd already fell. Uh, but, you know, I cannot judge because had it been me, I probably would have ruined it in two. So, you know, I, I, I cannot, cannot judge. But, you know, you see with, with the apple and the fall, it was actually the first evidence uh, humankind has of nutrigenomics at work. So obviously w- with me being a dietitian, of course, I was going to weave some dietetic jargon in here. Uh, but yes, but nutrigenomics is uh, the study of how nutrition changes the expression of genes and at that time you know our complete genetic makeup was completely rewired and we were predisposed to sin and sinful pleasure and the joy of evil and chasing it so bear in mind that even though that happened we still carried these two double-edged swords we still had a lot of free will and we had dominion over the earth and with those swords we wreaked absolute havoc over the face of the earth. So much so that by the time we got to the sixth chapter of the book, in verse five, God said, or the word said, that the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was so great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry. He was sorry that he'd made man on the earth, and the Lord was grieved in his heart. He was so grieved and so sad that we had all this free will, and we, we chose the other side. We chose evil, because evil was so pleasurable to us that we pushed the boundaries to experience new highs and to see how far we could go without destroying ourselves. And then we tried it again and again and again. If you're a parent in the room, raise your hand. You know, I think parents in the room would, um, would feel this, you know, very, very strongly. They would feel the heart of God on this one. You know, just imagine raising your children from innocence to, to sentience and giving them all the tools they need to succeed, but watching them destroy their lives anyway. And yet you have to honor their decision to do so because you've given them the free will 
to choose the path that they want. You see, we, we broke the heart of God as a human race, and we still break his heart to this day. And in fact, we have developed and we developed a society that has actually even erased our, our need for God. You see, when you were an ancient farmer and you placed a seed in the ground, you knew that if God did not bless that crop, harvest may not even come. And people would starve and die, people that you were responsible for. So you knew that God's blessing was the difference between that seed giving you a one-to-one harvest, that seed giving you a tenfold harvest, and that seed not even germinating at all. And now, you know, in this modern time, we just go to Aldi and we allow the cucumbers that we bought two weeks ago to spoil in the fridge. (laughs) Forgive me, Father. I'm confessing my sins before you all right now. I'm actually confessing before you all. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Um, But jokes aside, you know, that there was no hope for us while we were in sin. And all it did was make us more calloused and more cruel towards each other and towards the things of God. Our end was eternal separation from God, to be shut away in the darkness that we loved so much. But God had a plan from the very beginning. Hallelujah. He had a plan, and his deep and incomprehensibly steadfast love for us, it caused God to put a redemption package in place for us. Our redemption package. And let's be clear. You know, God never wanted us, his children, to be overcome by evil. We, we chose that. Uh, And we chose that life for ourselves. And even if it's not an active choice, our very flesh, it hurls itself at evil things because fulfillment of evil pleasures is written into the fabric of our DNA. And it was written into us after the fall. And every time we try to step forward into the light, because we gave the devil and his demons access to our soul and its strength, we were pulled back into darkness. And let me be candid with you. I'm not ashamed to say that, you know, I know what it means to have tasted evil. I know what it means to have ridden that slippery slope of backsliding and not being the man that I should be before God. I know exactly what that means. And the problem I had back then was I thought I could pull myself out. But no man can. We weren't designed for such a thing. Do you see, to pull yourself out, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You need the power of the Holy Spirit, and you need belief in the power of the blood of Jesus. So you can access the redemption of God. You can access that redemption package. And this is where the power of Jesus comes in. So we're allowed to get a bit excited about this now, actually. Because while we were deep in sin, Jesus took on all sin and took it to the cross with him and he perished with it he laid it to die forever and when he rose again he gave us the holy spirit and gave us an incorruptible spirit an incorruptible spirit that if we lean on this incorruptible spirit we will be able to see god on the other side of the demise of our flesh You see, death is not the end for us. So even with tears in our eyes or pain in our mortal bodies, what lies on the other side is greatness multiplied. Hallelujah. And an unlimited harvest, eternal life, a reuniting with the one who loves you and created you. Peace. Full stop. Peace. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Hashtag redemption package. And you want to know the best part? God allows us to live a life of redemption here first, before we even meet death. He gives us the opportunity to put right wrongs, He gives us the opportunity to advocate for the unaccounted and vulnerable. He gives us the opportunity to experience joy so we don't die thinking that all life had to offer was suffering. We all lost time in sin and we all lost time while we were in suffering. And even if you live in righteousness, we still live in a sinful world that propagates more suffering, more poverty, more sickness, more confusion, hopelessness. But God, 
He gives us time back and the opportunity for fellowship and partnership. Hallelujah. Because there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And this doesn't always mean a big boom of prosperity or mortal enrichment. You see, I should be able to preach this message in a hospital wing for the terminally ill where they may not see tomorrow. I should be able to preach this message in a prison where those who have committed heinous crimes may never ever see the light of day again. But you see, for every man, God promises one sure thing for your life. Significance. That is the one thing God promises without a doubt. That your life in Jesus, no matter who you are or where you're from, is a life of significance. It is a shining light in the darkness that pierces through as a beacon of hope that Christ can redeem even the worst of us and can give us beauty for ashes and he can redeem time. He can redeem. Turn to your neighbor and just say, he is a redeemer. He is a redeemer. Hallelujah. He is a redeemer. In fact, one of his Hebrew names is Goel, which means God, my redeemer. That is his name. His very personality is a personality of redemption. When he looks at you, he sees you as the biggest, brightest, shining star. He rejoices over you with singing when you wake up in the morning. Do you know that the word says that about your life? That's how God sees you. His child. His child. Parents in the room. You know what, you know what, you know what that's like. Looking at your children and seeing them as big, bright, shining stars, no matter what they're like. Because they're yours. They came from you. We have been redeemed and lifted, and God will give us joy, peace, and a hope that no one else can give. And you can share that with those who are lost around you, and we can bask in the great joy of heaven that a soul was saved because of you. Every single one of us has the ability to carry that redemption package from here to a lost soul, or to someone who is curious, or to someone who is yearning for a savior. We can carry redemption to them because redemption lives within us. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, um, you know, I'm just sort of thinking back to uh, sort of 2000 and 2010, you know, it's, uh, when I actually gave my life to Christ. I'd always grown up sort of within the church. I knew of God the Father, but I hadn't yet been acquainted with Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ and his power. Uh, and, you know, back in 2010, I think this was, that was the birth of the YouTube age, you know. For, so for those who are around my age, you know, like that they, they, may, that they may agree with that. And I remember watching a, a video on YouTube while I was in uni. So I was in uni at the time. And it was of uh, Christians in China who had been persecuted, you know, uh, children and adults, and they were given a fresh set of these donated Bibles. And, you know, they were all crying tears of unspeakable joy as they were ripping the plastic, you know, off these um, new Bibles. And, and it just brought me to tears. It absolutely finished me. It really, really convicted me. Because I was in uni at the time, and I was in the world. I was living in sin, and my Bible was on my bedside. It was physically collecting dust, and there were tea stains on it because I was actually using it as a coaster. Actually used it as a coaster. And here were these young children in China, you know, crying over brand new Bibles. And it changed my life forever because they knew that they had a savior. They knew that they had a savior and they were unspeakably grateful and for just having access to the word in a safe place that they could read whenever they wanted. There was no one conditioning them to read a particular thing. They could read the unfiltered word of God. Hallelujah. So I've been painting this picture for you, you know, uh, over the last sort of like 10 minutes or so uh, to just help us grasp what the love of God has done for us and help us understand what gratitude can free us as Christians to do. So, there are three things I wanted to share with you here. Christ saved me so, I can forgive, I can pray, and I can give. I'm hoping for time's sake I can actually get through everything. I think there's something about this pulpit, George. I think when people get here and they prepare these messages, they tend to extend. So if you guys have a good two to three hours, we can get through this content today, you know? The lamb can wait. But yes, uh, but yes. so I'll move on to the first thing, which is Christ saved me so I can forgive. And in forgiving, it's forgiving myself first, 
then it's forgiving those I love, and then it's forgiving those who hate me. Ooh. So, you know, when it comes to forgiving ourselves, we have to remember that the word of God says that once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. If you open your Bibles, you can turn to John 8, 36. Once you're there, let me know. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There we go. So therefore, if the Son makes you free... You shall be free indeed. You see, once we were guilty of mortal sin, but no longer. And in Romans 8.1, it says that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is scripture after scripture after scripture. I could be here all day affirming you with the power of forgiveness, the fact that God doesn't see wrongs in you. When you appear before him, once you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he doesn't see you as a common man. He doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus. He, that's how he sees you. The same way he esteems his, his son and he says that this is my son, you know, and I am proud of him and he will do great things. That's the same way that he sees you. So we have to look at sort of forgiving ourselves. And in forgiving ourselves, uh, I wanted us to, you know, just think about the scripture in Ephesians 6 that speaks about wearing the helmet of salvation. And uh, why a helmet? You know, when we're speaking about the armor of God, salvation is given, is given a helmet. And the reason why, you know, uh, we're having a helmet of salvation is so important is because, of course, it, it protects us from attacks to the mind, attacks to the head. Because if you don't understand and accept the scriptures above, who do you think is going to get into your mind? What do you think they're going to tell you? You're in grave danger of believing lies, half-truths, things that just do not weigh up. Because God has, has said through his unadulterated and powerful word that we are his, that we are his. And even if your path has been crooked, please repent, make yourself accountable. Don't go back because the mercies of God are new every morning. You wake each and every morning, sometimes with no recollection of what happened the day before. And that is God's grace and mercy to us, giving us the opportunity to physiologically start again with him because he's always there. He stands at the door knocking constantly, asking just that we'd open the door so he can come in and rush his mercies, rush his grace and rush his blessings into our lives. If you have done things that you can't even tell people about, today I'm asking you to lay it at the altar forgive yourself, move into the light, because that is where God wants you to be. So next we move on to being able to sort of love others, and especially loving, the, or loving and forgiving those around us. Because once you've been able to forgive yourself, you can extend, extend the same mercy that God has given to you to those you care the most about, because those are the people we take the most for granted. You see, the bond of family, the bond of friendship, the bond of love is one that goes under a lot of strain because you're always connected. So you take it for granted that it will always be there. But it's very, very, very important that you extend the mercy that God has given you. The way that God sees you is the way you must see those you love. Because your forgiveness can be the catalyst for revival in your home. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, some of us in, in this room may have gone through sort of family, uh, family destruction, you know, family arguments, rifts, you know, where there's darkness, where there is quietness. And, you know, in that silence, assumptions can be bred. And where assumptions are bred, malice and strife often follow because strife is a killer. And, you know, the devil, he comes prowling like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour and kill. You know, when, uh, when lions are hunting, they're, they're not hunting packs who are together. They're hunting things that are isolated on their own because they will have the highest chance of that kill. Do not let the devil come, come near your home because families are the cornerstone of God's kingdom because God himself 
is a family. He is a family God. He exists in plural. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Family. He exists in plural. So that, that is something that we, we must hold on to extremely strongly. And um, then moving on to that, it's we're then looking at being able to forgive those with malicious intent. Those who actually want to see us drown. Those who want us destroyed. You see, it, we live in a culture now where um, the general person is afraid of that kind of animosity because fear of, uh, of that enemy being part of a mob and potentially cancelling you is actually more worrying than um, being able to attack somebody head on. So for those who are not familiar with that sort of colloquialism, uh, being cancelled is simply a, a state of having everything you do or touch be, be blacklisted. But before I, I digress, you know, if you do anything of note in this world, you will eventually encounter an enemy. Somebody who prays for your demise. That's a real thing. Christ suffered a very horrific death at the hands of people who had been after him from the beginning. They, in the end, incited a riot and had him murdered, and he died the death of a criminal despite doing no wrong. Yet, on the cross, he was able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And how true Jesus was. Do you know that hatred changes your worldview so drastically that you can't comprehend the good in another human being? Do you, and do you know two things can be true at once? Your cruelest enemy is someone's kindest friend. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you help us to, to see that and understand that. Because we can use that information to pray a blessing over their heads. There are accounts of Roman soldiers who murdered Christ, yet they gave their lives to him later because Christ had no animosity towards them. He had bigger fish to fry, and so do we. We have kingdom business to do. And, you know, this isn't me dismissing nor condoning because there are, there are people who have abused their power. There are people who have done horrific and evil things. And you don't have to make an enemy a friend. But if God wills it, you could be the Barnabas to a Paul the Apostle. For those who don't, who don't know the story of, uh, of Paul the Apostle or, or Barnabas, you know, Paul was once named Saul. You know, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he calls himself. And he persecuted Christians. He actively went after them for their demise. He wanted to destroy the church until Jesus Christ came to him, blinded him, and then opened his eyes so that he could see and put him in the hands of those he had, who, who he had persecuted. And one man to stand up was a man called Barnabas. Barnabas was constantly under threat, and yet he stood out of the way of his own will and stood in the way of the will of the Father and allowed the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to flow through him and encourage Paul to be the best Christian he could be. That is a blessing that's been given to us all. We all carry that. We all have that power. And we can pray for that power because forgiveness is tough because forgiveness is not a human thing. Forgiveness comes from God. Forgiveness is a godly thing. And it takes the power of God to be able to do it and do it well. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the power to forgive. Oh, so I'm just gonna just gonna move on. I, I lost myself in the notes. Forgiveness is just such a. It's such, we live by forgiveness, so I get caught up when speaking about forgiveness. That, that 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 is all it is. So yes, remember that Christ saved us and gave us the permission to forgive. And because it's a godly trait, we need Him to to forgive. So this is where I move on next to prayer. Christ saved me so I can pray. So prayer in itself is a nuclear weapon in the face of the enemy and also our direct line to God. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah. You see, Christianity is the only religion where God is as much friend as he is deity. And it's the reason Christ died. Christ died so that we would have communion with the Father again. We broke the line. We broke the line, the line and access we had to God while we, while we were in sin. But we were redeemed for communion. We were redeemed. So we can, uh, we can pray to God 
we can speak to him, we can lay our burn, burdens on him, we can be restored, we can be refreshed. Oh, and even better, we can be renewed. We don't have to be the same people we were yesterday. We can be the best version of ourselves in him. Through that direct line, let us not neglect prayer. On the other side of that comes affirmation. You know, Christ saved me so. I can pray, and I can pray for affirmation. Because there is, there is con- constant messaging out there, constant messaging telling us who we are, what we should do. Uh, I woke up this morning and, uh, you know, I'm reading on Apple News, you know, um, ways to divorce your wife. Can you imagine? Like, you know, that these are the kinds of messages that are coming through subliminally, subliminally all the time. And if we are not countering, if we are not cognitively involved with what is going, up, going on up, up here and wearing our helmet of salvation and blasting back with the truth, we will live by lies. That is not, that is not what, what we need. That is not what we need. And the most beautiful thing about affirmation is when you're praying affirmations over yourself, you build muscles, spiritual muscles, that allow you to then pray affirmation over others. There are people who are weak, And there's a time when you will be weak, where you won't be able to uh, ask for affirmation. You won't be able to ask for strength. And because of the encouragement and the power and the warmth of the Holy Spirit that is around you and your friend group, they will be able to lift you up when you need it. They will, because God is a family God. I keep on coming back to that. He is a family God. He wants to see his kingdom. He wants to see his family raised up. No one should have their head down in church. So if someone has their head down in church today, we're going to find them. We're going to pray for them. That's what we're going to do. We're going to find them and we're going to lift them up and tell them that God loves them, that God redeemed them, and that we love them. We may not even know their struggle. We may not even be able to relate to it. But that affirmation, that connection through compassion, the compassion of Jesus Christ, it lifts the whole church. Hallelujah. And... Um, then that moves us on to the final area, which is intercession. Being able to pray for those we don't even know. We don't even know. You know, when you've tarried in prayer and you've prevailed many times in supplication and in fasting, the power of Christ, he opens another door for revival. And that is intercession. You know, many, many a move within Christianity, many revivals were started through prayer. Just interceding wanting to see the kingdom of God, wanting to see the will of God done in various places. You know, I, I, know, I know people that have interceded for, for nations. I know people who have also inter- interceded on behalf of a spouse that they hadn't even married yet. I was actually one of those people, you know. I, I, prayed, I prayed about Hanum coming into my life four or five years before she even came. I was on my knees, you know, while I was alone. Oh, Lord, I pray that whatever my future wife is doing, be there for her, be her guide. Lord, cover her, protect her. May no, may no undue harm come her way in the name of Jesus. You know, all of us here are living, living in the intercessory prayer of somebody else. We're all standing because someone else that you don't know is praying for us right now, praying for you. You know, has anyone ever heard about that phrase, granny's prayers? You know, the prayer of a, of, a, of, a, of a loving grandmother, you know, who just stands there and tarries and prevails in prayer. And, you know, there are times that maybe you got out of, out of troubles that, you know, you didn't even see the way out of. But granny's prayers came through for you. They came through for you. So this uh, moves me on to the next progression. Uh, I don't know how much time I got left. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and, try and get through this one as quickly as I can. And that is, Christ saved me so I can give. And um, in, within giving, you know, the first thing that I wanted to touch on was sort of giving our, our time, you know. Because time is a very special commodity because it's always on a limiter. And it's a resource we must allocate wisely as God numbers our days and orders the good works of our hands and feet. And, you know, if you read through Psalm 37, 23, it tells us about the fact that, you know, that the steps of the righteous man are ordered by the Lord. He directs his paths and he delights in his way. Hallelujah. God wants to see you do good things. He's laid them out for you. If you yield to his will, those things will happen. Those things will happen and you will receive his blessing. Every procrastination, and I'm preaching to myself on this one, is a boast against God saying, I can create more time. And we can do no such thing. We only need to use our time efficiently. Uh, and with time being such a resource, you know, how beautiful it is to use our time for the things of God. And if you have, you know, limited capacity 
or sorry, or if you have capacity, sorry, but limited finance, pray for God to show you places where you can use your time to bless others. You know, some people feel that they can't give because they lack capacity, whether it's in finance, whether it's in time, whether even, even if it's in ability. But just remember that, you know, God is not in the business of using people who are fully ready to do things. He's in the business of using those who are available to him. So if we make ourselves available, God will do the rest. You just have to show up and you have to be consistent. And if, you, and if you are consistent, then the blessings of God can compound and things can happen for you in, in, in other places so that you can continue to be, to be a blessing in, in that respect. So, uh, you know, a good example of this is investing in the children and young adults of this church. You know, when it comes to them, the harvest is indeed plenty, but the laborers are, are few, you know. Uh, so if you can spare time, speak to Debbie, speak to Ellie, speak to Emmanuel. Our young people are growing in sweltering numbers and they need mentoring from tried and tested men and women of God. You know, if um, you are are within this church and not yet part of a growth group as well, you know, uh, if you're a growth group leader, could you raise your hand so people can see who you are? Yeah, there we go. So we've got them hiding in the audience. They're here. They're here. You know, and you are looking for a place, you know, to be able to to be able to support. You could support those growth group leaders, you know, Uh, being able to help them with putting together messages or just supporting them with being able to, you know, just to to share and to bring people together, bringing food to some of these meetings, if, if possible. Then I'll turn up, you know, it's no problem. So in all these things, we can use wisdom, you know, Um, and just remember that only God is omnipresent. So you cannot be everywhere at once. So pick something you can do for God, give your best and manage your own affairs as best you can, because this church doesn't believe in burning out its members. And it is a shining light. Of, uh, of, of good stewardship, you know. Uh, the reason this church has been growing and growing and growing is just because uh, our leadership, they believe in stewardship and, you know, righteous stewardship, you know, that doesn't burn out its members but takes care of people. And the thing is, in order to keep on taking care of people, it's numbers. It's numbers we need. So, you know, if you, are, if you feel like you have the capacity, pray to God for more, come and join us. Come and join us and help us. In the, in the next area, we're sort of then looking at sort of financial giving, you know, our tithes and offerings. With regards to sort of tithes and offerings, everyone, anyone who knows me intimately knows that I do not play with tithing. Um, and it's not because I'm a, dutiful, I'm a dutiful giver, nor am I a brainwashed one. I give because everything I actually have came from God. I do, I do. And I don't give 10% because God needs 10%. Uh, I give because he gave me 100%, and it's, it's just the thing I can do to just honor him back and just say, Lord, thank you. Listen, I am in good health in the name of Jesus. I have a good reputation in the name of Jesus. You are opening up opportunities, blessings, and favor for me in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, what, what is my money? What, is my, what are my resources that you cannot have them? And, um, you know, the good thing about, being, about giving is the fact that there are spiritual laws attached to it. You know, anything you give to God, anything you give to God, do you know he, he also blesses you back? He, he, he brings it back, pressed down, shaking together, running over in your bosom. Jesus himself says that, red letters, in red letters, you know, the words of Jesus himself. Jesus wants a, a cheerful giver, people who will give out of honor. You know, God, God doesn't need duty. He just needs honor. You know, I gave that example earlier about the ancient farmer who plants his seed and prays to God for an increase. We are all that farmer. We are all that farmer. I know that there are, there are systems now that allow us to keep on going out there and making and doing and surviving, maybe, maybe without uh, what we think is God's direct hand on us, but his hand is always over us. If you're in good health and you can work, God's hand is over you in the name of Jesus. It is. And I pray that blessing over you all, that God's hand will continue to be over you, that he will carry you, that he will be your strength, that he will be your guide, that he will be the lifter of your heads, so that wherever you go, you will shine forth his glorious light and people will come to to the Lord and glorify him because they know that you are a carrier of the Redeemer in the name of Jesus. So if you don't know how to give, start small and be consistent and cheerful. That is all God wants. He doesn't want, he doesn't want everything from you. He just wants you to be consistent with him. That is it. That is all. Which brings me now to my final point, and hopefully I'm good for time, hopefully, um, which is being able to give to others, you know, 
And in being able to sort of give to others, we just need to remember to love our enemies. We need to do good and we need to lend, hoping for nothing in return, for our reward will be great and we will be sons of the Most High. That is what is said of us in Luke 6, 34. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to just say thank you for letting me preach to you today. Um, you know, we're just going to pray a quick blessing over you all. And, um, and yeah, and then we will, we'll take sort of our, our final song before we go. So, Father, Lord God, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for your sacrifice, for wrapping yourself in flesh and coming down, living, living our human life, evading all temptation, putting to death sin on the cross and redeeming us into your wondrous light. Lord, as we go out today, we just pray for your strength, your ability, and we pray for your capacity to help us to move from this step to the next and bring glory to your name in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.